Usually when we talk about climate change, it's about bad news. From rising temperatures to worsening extreme weather, like the extreme drought turned extreme flood, now plaguing much of the state of California. But now it seems we have some good news. A new United Nations-backed report found that the Earth's ozone layer is on track to recover completely within decades, thanks to ozone-depleting chemicals being phased out across the world. International cooperation has helped alleviate the damage. Joining me to discuss is an international leader on the issue of ozone damage. Susan Solomon is a professor of atmospheric science at MIT and the chair of the university's program in atmospheres, oceans, and climate. Her research was critical to understanding why the ozone hole occurs in Antarctica. Susan Solomon, thank you for joining us. Perhaps we can start with just a very basic reminder to the audience of why a hole in the ozone layer matters. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, the, the ozone layer is absolutely essential to life on Earth. If we didn't have it, we would all be burned to a crisp by the sun's ultraviolet. And I think everyone can appreciate that. If you've ever been sunburned, you know ultraviolet light's bad for your skin, can even give you skin cancer, die. Um, so the ozone layer is critical to keep safe and healthy. So what has happened? Can you explain to us, is this really the end of the problem? What does it mean? Wonderful things have happened. Countries have gotten together and decided to phase out the chemicals that were actually causing the ozone depletion to occur. Those chemicals are called mainly chlorofluorocarbons, and we used to have them in refrigerators and air conditioners and spray cans and all kinds of things. Um, public pressure, particularly actually in the United States, led to the phase out of the chlorofluorocarbons in spray cans in 1978. It took a lot longer to get rid of them in other applications, but we're now in a situation where the whole world, and that includes India, China, everybody, is not producing these chemicals in significant amounts anymore. So that's really good news. What it means is that the ozone layer has slowly started to heal. It takes a long time because these chemicals last in the atmosphere um, some 50 to 100 years after we put them in. So we're going to so remind the audience exactly how much uh, this will mean that the ozone layer will go back to 1980 levels by 2040. For most of the world. Uh, the time frame of recovery in the Arctic is a bit longer. It's estimated at 2045 over the Arctic and 2066 over the Antarctic. Is that fast enough to help the damage that's already been done? Oh, it's, it's huge because I think the other thing you have to put in context is if we hadn't started phasing out those chemicals, they would have kept increasing at an exponential rate. And, and by now, we actually would have had massive ozone losses all around the world. So things would have been much worse. So we do have some ozone loss, um, and it's going to get better, as you said, slowly. Uh, but but um, eventually, we will have a healed ozone layer. We're already seeing signs of recovery. And that's the best we can do at this point. There's no removing those chemicals once they're already in the atmosphere. So there are other chemicals, though, that are discussed that seem to have taken the place of chlorofluorocarbons, the CFCs, HFCs, which are used in refrigerants. Are there still chemicals we have to worry about? Well, this is actually the incredibly good news about what the uh, protocol on the ozone layer has achieved. The uh, uh, compounds that replaced the chlorofluorocarbons are greenhouse gases. So they contribute to climate change. And if we were to keep producing them at the rates that we would expect, by 2050, they, they probably would cause something like a third to a half a degree Celsius of extra warming. So almost a full degree Fahrenheit of extra warming. But we've also started phasing them out. And, and that's that's just amazing. This is the protocol that just keeps on giving, you know, <laughs> solved the ozone hole and now is uh, contributing to combating climate change. But so, so are climate scientists breaking out the champagne, locally sourced, of course, but is that what's happening? 
Yeah, I mean, basically, I I, I think that uh, um, we're all quite uh, amazed by the progress that's been made. People, uh, as I said, I think the the action of the public in in kickstarting this. Uh, this pathway to improvement was critical in this. We had a lot of uh, very um, good cooperation from industry, actually. Uh, they were against it in the beginning, but over time, they adjusted their thinking and, and began to realize that there was much more to be gained by being um, serious about improving the planet. So um, it's, it is really cause for celebration. And yes, uh, we're, we're quite delighted. I think the thing to not be misled by is from year to year, you might hear that we had a colder than normal year in the Antarctic, which would cause increased ozone loss. So it, it'll still go up and down a little bit from one year to another. We might have some volcanoes. They also give you a little bit of extra ozone loss. So it, it you know, don't be misled by a blip, I guess. Um, but but expect to see things be a lot better. Don't but, take your sunscreen off right now. You know, wait for a few decades. <laughs> but wait for a few decades. People may be a bit confused by this and think that the climate problem is really coming to a close. They may confuse the issues related to the ozone with just issues related to greenhouse gases generally. Can you spell that out? I think there, yes. there will be confusion. Yeah. There, there will be, um, and that's perfectly natural, but the main thing causing our climate to change is our emission of carbon dioxide, mainly from fossil fuel burning and to a lesser extent from deforestation. That is a, a separate problem from the chlorofluorocarbon. So it would have been much worse had we not phased out these extra molecules but, but they are not the primary cause of climate change. What we need to do to solve climate change, change will be to uh, drastically reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide. So, There's no way around it. So the political will, as you pointed out, around the Montreal Protocol, which was this intergovernmental agreement that came into force in the late 80s, um, there was unusual cohesion and agreement by governments. We just don't have it now on other issues when it comes to tackling climate change, starting within our own country. What are your thoughts on how we can move forward? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that uh, it's extremely important to acknowledge the different points of view. Um, that was a key part of the negotiations on, in, 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 on the ozone layer, and it is continuing to be a key part of discussions on climate change. Um, but I, I think clearly science alone is never enough. It's always necessary, but it's, it's, it's not enough. The science has advanced in both areas. People have to perceive how their climate is changing. So my advice to people is, you know, go outside and, and actually experience it yourself. Think about whether your summers are hotter than they used to be, whether your nights are hotter than they used to be. They, they almost certainly are all around the world. Um, and obviously, we have massive problems in certain places with heavy rainfall going on right now in California. It's horrendous. That's actually also probably exacerbated by climate change. So we, we really need to start thinking about climate change in the same way we thought about ozone, as a problem for people to engage with and also as a problem for industry to to actually take really seriously. And, and I think that's the hard part. Okay. The, the, yep. the fossil fuel industry has had to be brought to the table. Much well, that, more that they dragged to the table would probably be more, more apt. <laughs> but um, just a very, very quick final question for you. Maura Healy is appointing a climate chief. She's the first governor in a state to do so. Um, you understand the global impact uh, of climate change and working with other global leaders. What do you think a governor can do to have an impact more broadly, even outside of Massachusetts? What can one governor's action do? Well, I, I, certainly state regulations play a big role in driving the market. Um, when the state of Massachusetts greatly incentivizes electric vehicles, for example, um, or um, solar power or heat pumps, which we are doing. 
uh, with the help of the federal government in some play, in some cases, but but not always. We're doing extra on our own, which is great. Um, what that does is to increase the market for those things. And as the market gets bigger, the costs go down. And then other places will, will adopt it as well. Plus, it puts pressure on the industry to all those industries, the vehicle industry, the solar industry, et cetera, to develop more uh, uh, cheap uh, uh, options for consumers. All right. And, Susan, and the more we as consumers do that, the more we promote it. All right. Thank you. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there, Dr. Solomon. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me.